Setting a proper stocking rate is one of the most important grazing management decisions that need to be made and today in integrated rangeland management we're going to talk about what you need to consider to set the proper stocking rate. This is Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho. You can remember when you're thinking about how many animals or what sorts of grazing decisions there's many things that are kind of out of your control. The climate topography which affect the vegetation community, how much is there and with a type of forage and also the wildlife community. Um, we don't have a lot of control over those but they influence our management options and decisions. In the middle then we have a decisions that we need to make if we're going to graze livestock, what species, what type of animal, how many animals, that's the stocking rate question, and then we'll have, we need to have a grazing plan, when and how long to graze. We'll talk about that later in the class. What's important is these three decisions that we make as range managers affect other very important factors. They affect the health of the vegetation community. Uh, they affect the productivity of animals, how much weight they gain, how much we might be able to make and produce of livestock. And they also affect the wildlife community. And all of these things are interacting. So there are continual interactions between livestock, wildlife, and vegetation. Again, this is just part of the multitasking of being a good rangeland manager. The one that I hadn't mentioned here is grazing distribution. It, it has a lot to do with animal behavior and understanding the behavior of animals, which we will also talk about later in this class. But it's not so much a decision as just a management approach where if you have distribution problems of livestock, they can change vegetation, um, the livestock productivity or the wildlife community, but they're handled in a little different way. So again, those four grazing management factors. What is the animal species or class of animal? whether it's young, old, mature, uh, is it uh, lactating or open? What is the stocking rate? How many animals? How long to graze or not graze? That would be part of the grazing plan. And then uh, the distribution of animals, where they graze. Let's start with that decision about uh, how many to graze. A couple terms we have to have cleared up before we can move forward. One is carrying capacity. Now carrying capacity is something that Mother Nature gives us. It's, it's the affected by the land and vegetation characteristics. So the, the weather and the soils and the land affect the number of animals a piece of land can support on a long-term basis without causing damage to the ecosystem. It's expressed in animals per some area per year. Often we express it in AUMs or animal unit months per year per acre. Uh, and it is the unit on which land is bought and sold. So if you're thinking about going into uh, a business of enterprise, uh, an enterprise of uh, um, assessment, appraisal, or if you are trying to buy land or sell land, it's this unit, this carrying capacity, the potential of the land to produce forage that you will, uh, that you will be thinking about. Another term to keep in your back pocket is what is stocking rate and how does that differ from carrying capacity? Stocking rate is the number of animals that the land manager decides to place on the land for a specific period of time. Yeah, of course it's related to carrying capacity because that will determine what's sort of the maximum animals that you can put there, but it's not exactly the same because the manager might have different goals or objectives to accomplish with the stocking rate. So it is, you have to have a number of animals, you have to have a specific area of land, and you have to have a specific period in order to uh, d define a stocking rate. And it's very important because it affects the rangeland health and economic returns and the livestock productivity of the, of the range. You've probably heard this term, animal unit or animal unit month. I want to distinguish between an animal unit and an animal unit month. An animal unit is really an, a unit of animal. It's a block of 1,000 pounds of grazing animal, of ruminant grazing animal. Um, back when they first started counting cattle and, and uh, sheep out on uh, federal lands, when they first started to think about um, putting on permit uh, fees, so that was early in the 19th century, the Forest Service and the BLM had to come up with a way to count and uh, equate animals so they came up with this term of animal unit, and in that time, a, a normal cow weighed about a thousand pounds. So one cow was one animal unit, or one animal unit equivalent, and there was one cow per animal unit. Horses then were a little, uh, they, because they eat more, they would be 1.8 animal unit equivalents, and it would take uh, about a half of a horse would be an animal unit. Let's move down to sheep. Sheep um, are about a fifth of an animal unit. So 
It takes about five sheep to make one animal unit. I've even read in a, 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 a document one time that it takes 50 rabbits, jackrabbits, to make an animal unit. So I think the first terms were um, when they had one cow was an animal unit and five sheep was an animal unit. And then the, the term has just kind of moved on from then and we now have this animal unit equivalent term and that's the conversion factor that reflects the number of animals, uh, the number of animal units in the average animal. This of course is all um, related to forage demand. We always use this two and a half percent of body weight per year for ruminants, so cattle, sheep, goats, We've talked about changing that a little bit. If you get smaller animals, they eat a bit more. Larger animals, lit a bit less. Hind get fermenters, of course, eat significantly more, about three or more percent of their body weight. So horses, rabbits, and rodents would be higher uh, parts of an animal unit than ruminants. Also, I want to remember, I want you to remember that we are going to express forage demand on an average across the year basis. Even though we know that that varies throughout the year, we, we know that animals eat more during lactation, they'll have higher demands during late gestation, although they might not eat more, and they also would have higher demands and eat more in the winter for thermal regulation. We also have discussed that animals eat the most when forage is high, of highest quality and very digestible. So when the, animal, when the forage is actively growing, like in the spring, they'll eat more. So knowing those things, we know that, um, that forage demand or forage intake will change very significantly throughout the year. And yet when we're calculating stocking rates, we kind of just take a yearly or seasonal average. Now an animal unit month is something different than an animal unit. An animal unit month is the amount of forage that an animal unit will eat in a month. So an animal unit is that thousand pound block of animal. How much would that animal eat, a thousand pound animal eat in a month? How many pounds would that be? Think about it. We know that a thousand pound animal ruminant should eat about two and a half percent of their body weight. We know that there's 30 days in a month. So the amount of forage that an AUM is could be calculated from that. So how much is that? Well, 1,000 pound animal times 2.5% body weight is 25 pounds a day. 25 pounds times 30 days in a month is about 750. So in this class, uh, uh, we're going to talk about an animal unit month as being 750 pounds. I'm just going to warn you, uh, some agencies like the Forest Service and the Natural Resources Conservation Service, they're a little more conservative. They use like 780 to 800 pounds per AUM. Other people might use less. So that there's no magic number that an AUM is. Uh, in this class, we're going to use 750, and that will be in the ballpark of what most people would consider an AUM. Again, that's on a dry matter basis. 750 pounds of forage equals an AUM. Don't forget, an AUM is an amount of forage. An animal unit is an amount of animal. So let's go into three different and, and important factors about why we might set a proper stocking weight. First, let's think about the range health standpoint. To set a proper stocking rate from a range health standpoint, then you, you, one of the things you want to do is maintain sufficient plant residue after the animals are gone. So, so even when the animals are foraging, you want to make sure that there's enough leftover forage to maintain range health. Now, now what would that leftover um, plant residue be good for? Think about it. At least three things it would be important for. One is you've got to leave enough forage behind so the plant can regrow. Remember we talked about the plants um, recovering from grazing because of the photosynthetic material and they're, they're bringing in carbon. So you, when an animal is out there, you gotta leave enough residue on the plant, live plant, so the plant can regrow. You also gotta account for enough plant material out there so that wildlife have forage to eat. And everyone I know that's managing rangeland wants to provide forage for big wildlife like elk and deer, but also remember small critters like uh, grasshoppers and insects eat a lot of forage too and you need to make sure there's enough residue behind for those animals or you could get into a situation of overgrazing. And then finally, you want to leave residue behind to promote soil health and prevent erosion. So if those are things that are in your mind and in your uh, goals as a manager, then you want to set the stocking rate somewhere below carrying capacity. In other words, you want to put an amount of animals out there that will allow for the, the land to be sustained on a long-term basis. Because remember, that's the def definition of carrying capacity, a level that would, would allow the land to be sustained and be healthy on a long-term basis. 
So the, if you set stocking rate below carrying capacity, there's several advantages. It does allow for um, some variation during drought. If you have very healthy plants, they can uh, have good access to soil water way deep into the soil, so they survive better during drought. It allows for some extra forage during periods of low productivity. If you go into a, a year where there's not as much forage, um, you, having some residue from the previous year can be of an advantage. Maintaining healthy plant communities also means that those desirable plants are using most of the resources and they can reduce weed invasion. Now, it's not always true. Some weeds are really well adapted to the ecosystem and they'll come in regardless of how healthy the range is. But in general, a healthy range is better at um, warding off or reducing weed invasion. There is a flip side to this, however. If you have a lot of residue left behind, that residue is also fuel. So if you're setting stocking rate very low, then you might have a lot of fuel and a greater risk of wildfire. So it's kind of a pro-con, and the manager has to decide where they fit on that continuum. There are these things we call utilization guidelines, and these are just starting points. Uh, they're based on ecological research that is based on individual plants, and they looked at individual plants in different ecosystems, scientists, uh, did and then they decided well how much of that plant could I remove without causing damage to the plant and over time looking at a bunch of studies some guidelines have come up they have been come uh, developed such as on short grass prairie the plants are very highly developed or um, adjusted to uh, high levels of, of uh, utilization because they evolved in an area where there was heavy bison uh, herbivory so over time, they've developed mechanisms to withstand grazing. So you can take half leaf half, 40 to 50% of the plant can be removed every year and still be sustained. On the other side of the Rockies, our side of the Rockies in the sagebrush grasslands, animals mostly use that seasonal suitability type of grazing where they would graze lower in the elevation and move up in elevation. And under those settings, uh, plants did not really evolve with um, heavy grazing throughout the whole season. So the rule of thumb might be take some leave more. So in the sagebrush grasslands, the conifer forests, or the oak woodlands, uh, ecological utilization guidelines are usually 30 to 40 percent. There's a couple of problems with these guidelines though. Um, one is that they are assuming that, that it's the major forage plants that uh, the studies were done on. They were also done on individual plants, not whole pastures. Even though sometimes you see these guidelines uh, uh, applied to a whole pasture. The guidelines were, were developed on individual plants. And so that, that's a problem for it. And also there's nothing about season, and we know that season matters, that plants are more able to withstand grazing when there's plenty of resources available, such as early in the spring or, or you know when they're just uh, having several leaves up and they're able to photosynthesize and the, the climate is good for a recovery. They're also very able to withstand grazing after they've produced seed. Uh, it's that time right during inflorescence and seed production that is most damaging. And these guidelines don't account for that at all. Here, here's some of the, what some of those guidelines look like and what they were developed on. This is a graph that is out of um, a, some, some guidelines from that were put out by the NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. And what they, these studies did is they looked at root growth and they took forage grasses and they removed the amount of, uh, of biomass above ground, the leaves, and they found that when you had about 50% leaf removal that you would stop or slow root growth. Okay, so in other words, you could uh, remove about 50% of the leaves and, that, and up to that point you wouldn't see any reduction or, uh, or, or slowing of root growth until you hit about 50 once you get to 60, 70, 80 percent, then you start to see real reduction in root growth. So that was viewed as the point at which you want to really keep the roots growing, and that's a sign of the plant being healthy enough and withstanding grazing. So it was studies like this from which that take half, leave half idea came. That's not a bad place to start, but again, it doesn't account for some intricacies about when is the plant um, growing and how available are nutrients. This picture depicts a, a, a relatively famous uh, study where uh, Kreider was a researcher who uh, actually took plants and removed 50, 70, 
or 90% of the forage on a regular basis and you watch for root response and you know pictures are better than words at times and this certainly shows that up to 50% you have some root loss but when you get to 70 and 90 then you really see root loss and that would really uh, be damaging to the plant on a long-term basis. Another uh, point that was made earlier, but we can think about that now, is how um, having reduced root growth might influence weed invasion. So on the left is a very healthy plant with very low uh, utilization and very healthy roots. If you have some uh, use above ground and you reduce root mass by 30%, that middle pane, then you might start to um, increase use and reduce root growth even more, and that would leave space and resources for invasion of plants. So this is the, that general idea that it's important to keep roots healthy. So that's why there's such a, a focus on roots when we think about utilization levels. So again, utilization levels are guidelines. They're not rules. The effect of defoliation or utilization really depends on the season of the year. Uh, winter is less than spring, which is less than the, when the, flowering, the plant is flowering or at seed set. It depends on the moisture and nutrients available for recovery. Animals or plants are able to recover from herbivory if they have the resources to do that. And that's usually early in the season when there's plenty of moisture and the environment is conducive for regrowth. It also depends on the plant. Some plants simply have greater abilities to recover. They're, they're more resistant to grazing. They have more um, meristems or they might have that faster leaf replace re replacement potential or grasses which have intercalary meristems. So there are characteristics of the plant that make it more or less able to handle defoliation. And then finally, uh, these utilization guidelines don't, don't include how long is the plant going to have to recover afterward. Is it going to have just a few weeks or is it going to have three years? So the time for recovery can be really important in the ability of the plant to recover from defoliation and those are not included in these, in these utilization guidelines. So you got to start somewhere. You have to start with some utilization level that you're going to try to approximate on the land, but uh, it, there's a lot of devils in those, de a lot of details in that. So just be really careful. These are guidelines, not rules. Okay, so having said that, there are guidelines, not rules. You got to have some allowable use or recommended use or proper use factor. You got to start somewhere. Take half, leave half is the one that's often used. I like take some, leave more, but uh, it just depends on your management style and where you're managing. But here's how that would work. You got a total amount of forage, you have some recommended use or a proper use factor, and that will give you the usable forage supply on which you could set a stocking rate. So if you had a thousand pounds per acre and you've decided for whatever reason to use 45% of the uh, forage out there, that would mean that you'd have 450 pounds per acre on which you could develop a stocking rate or figure out how many animals to put on the range. Remember that heavy use does not equal overgrazing. Overgrazing is defined as the amount, is, as repeated heavy grazing in a way that damages the plant community. Heavy grazing is just a period of, of heavy use during a specific season, such as um, really high utilization that is, is very observable, but that doesn't mean it's overgrazing. So heavy use does not necessarily lead to overgrazing or damage to the community. I just say this because a lot of times I, I'll be out with folks and they'll say, oh God, this, this land is hammered, man, it's really heavily used. Unless you know how long the plant community has to recover or if it's been grazed, how frequently, or if you have a really good idea of whether the plant, the plant community is healthy or not, you can't say it's overgrazed. So heavy use does not equal overgrazing. So in summary then, from a range health standpoint, you could set a stocking rate uh, below carrying capacity and that would provide for healthy soil. It could slow weed plant invasion, weedy plant invasion. It would probably improve drought resistance of the plants. It would allow those plants to recover and get through a drought. And if you do it right and you get the right stocking rate, you can even improve the condition of land and, and of degraded land in a way that it's, it's like a restoration practice, getting the stocking rate right to improve degraded land would be considered a restoration practice. Let's change our attention now to animals. What is the proper stocking rate from, a, from an animal production standpoint? Here's a study that was done by John Launchbaugh in 1957. It's kind of uh, interesting to think that I was able to uh, 
married the son of a very famous grazing scientist. So Dr. Launchbaugh, John Launchbaugh and I had a lot of early discussions about grazing. And in fact, till the, till the day he died, we talked about studies such as this one. This is a really instrumental study in helping people understand um, how grazing stocking rates affect animal gain. Uh, John worked in Kansas and he did a really simple study way back then. He put animals in different pastures and he had three different stocking rates, a low stocking rate, one that was double to that was a medium, st medium stocking rate and then doubled the stocking rate again to a high stocking rate. And every uh, two weeks he weighed the animals so he could see how much they were gaining. He used steers so these, there was no lactation or any uh, you know, pregnancy involved. There's just steers and he was looking at animal gain. Put animals on the range in May and of course they started gaining weight. And right away he saw an effect of the animals in the high stocking rate that for some reason they just weren't gaining as well as those in the medium or the low. And throughout the this summer, he noticed that those animals in the high stocking rates, they did grow, but at a much slower rate than those at the medium or low stocking rates. And it wasn't until September or late in the season when he started see, to see animals at the medium stocking rate even diverge from those at a lower rate. So take home message, yes, higher stocking rates can reduce the animal gain, the amount of weight and, and growth that animals can attain. Um, probably a more interesting point was, um, to John's credit, he realized that, that, that something was going on because that low and medium stocking rate, even though one was about twice as much um, uh, animals in the pasture, those animals gained well until late in the season. So from that, he uh, developed the idea of what's called early intensive stocking. So his idea with this was why not just double the stocking rate on areas and then keep them in there just for the first half of the season because the animals could gain very well at a higher stocking rate as long as the, as the plants were actively growing. So now you'll see throughout Oklahoma and Kansas and into the Panhandle of Texas that intensive early stocking systems are, are used because of this study that realized that, that stocking rate is, is, is less important in terms of animal gain when the plants are actively growing. Okay, let's think about that. At higher stocking rates, animals have less gain. They're, they're less productive. They don't gain as well. Why is that? So on this graph, we have individual animal production. They start out gaining 100%. What is the maximum that they can gain based on the type of animal they are and their genetic potential? At low stocking rates, they, they go out and use the forage and they, they meet their maximum. And as stocking rate increases, you get to some point where animals will start not being as productive. They, they weren't, they're not going to gain quite as well. So that's that area right there at pretty high, moderate, or low ex excessive stocking rates. Why is that? Why don't animals gain as well as stocking rate increases? So when you get more and more animals in the pasture, each individual animal isn't getting as fat as they could. Why is that? They're not gaining as much weight as they could. Think about that. Yeah, there's about four or five reasons are some of the main reasons. One is just certainly because there's not as much forage per animal. So animals aren't getting as much as they would like. A second is that they're not getting exactly what they would like. They're not able to, um, to uh, select as high a quality diet. And then furthermore, it's taking them more energy to get that forage. They're having to travel farther. They're having to work a bit harder. And when you get to really, really excessive stocking rates where there's a lot of animals and they're in low condition, then you can start to have a situation where there's increased stress and increased disease among animals. So the first effects you're going to see is lower forage quantity and quality and more energy required to select the food. Those will all increase growth. And then finally, at really high rates, you might have disease and stress. Now let's switch that around. Um, it's nice to keep animals productive and, and as productive as possible, but in the end of the year, you have to pay the land per acre. You have to pay for the mortgage per acre, and you want to think about the production of animals per acre. How many animals could you produce on your management unit? So if you start on the left-hand side of this graph and you've got uh, 10 animals, let's say you double that. You still have very productive animals. You've doubled the amount of uh, production per acre. And you add more and more and more and more. And every time you add an animal, you're getting more production per acre because you have more animals out there to use the forage that's available. But then on the right hand side, somewhere after moderate and around excessive, you start to have a situation where the individual animal gain is decreasing at a rate that now you start to see less production per acre. In other words, you put another animal out there 
and all of the animals are going to come back just a little bit thinner. So there is some point where you start putting animals out on the range and all of them are going to lose weight. Here's a graph that was uh, created by Beeman in um, uh, quite a long time ago, and it's just a conceptual graph where you see those two ideas coming together. Animals will have maximum gain per animal and at an under, when the, the range is understocked, and it's, you're not going to have very, many, very much gain per acre. So as you increase stocking, to, uh, you'll have decreased animal production per animal, but you're going to have increased animal production per acre. And then in the middle of that graph, is there somewhere in there is this, this hypothetical optimum range where animals are still gaining fairly well. They're starting to decrease production per animal, but you're having more gain per acre. And then you get to a point where the production per animal is becoming so prohibitive that you're starting to lose uh, gain per acre. So that optimal is there somewhere in the middle where you have very good um, gain per animal, but you're also increasing the gain per um, acre. So from an animal production standpoint, then uh, you want to set the stocking rate at or below carrying capacity because you want desirable production per animal. And animals are really sensitive to the point where you might have stocking rates that are excessive and they're starting to lose forage quantity and quality. The optimal production per acre is also really important. Now, which is more important to you, the production per acre or production per animal, depends a bit on your management goals. People that are producing um, like heifers or bulls for uh, breeding, they're producing seed stock, they might be more interested in the production per animal. Whereas other people who are really just trying to pay the mortgage and, and, and get the expenses of the ranch handled, that they may be fine with really focusing on the production per acre. So what is desirable or optimal really depends on the manager's goals. Let's turn to the third aspect that we need to think about with stocking rates, and that's from an economic standpoint. Okay, go back to your uh, you know, Econ 202 class and think about this. First of all, when you're managing land, uh, we have a, a graph here that if it, say you had 640 acres, a square mile of land, and you had a number of steers, there's a fixed cost of production. No matter how many steers you have out there, whether you have zero or you know, 100, it doesn't matter. There's going to be some fixed costs. That would be the fence, you gotta pay the taxes, you gotta have a pickup. So there's certain things you have to have whether you have 10 animals or 50 animals or 100 animals. Those are fixed costs. Also remember that there's these, uh, these variable costs that every time you add another animal, you're going to have increased costs, such as increased feed in the winter. Uh, uh, veterinary supplies would be another good example of variable costs. Every time you add an animal, you might need more hired labor. You might need more time, uh, human hours to manage those animals. So there's some cost that every time you increase, uh, uh, every time you get more steers out there or more animals out there, you're going to increase the, the costs on the ranch because they have some costs that are, that are associated with those individual animals. Now, this isn't always a straight line because you might only need one hired person and then you need two, so you're going to have this kind of increase. So it's not always a beautiful straight line like I've drawn here, but in concept, there's fixed costs and variable costs. The total costs of the ranch are that top green line. So let's combine those two ideas. Now let's combine production per acre because that's the amount of animals or weight that you're going to be able to sell to, uh, to help keep the ranch going. And then you have your costs that if you get at low stocking rates, uh, you don't have enough animals on the land to really have high production per acre. Your costs are fairly low, but you're not meeting the costs. And then there's a point where that red line crosses the brown line, and you're in a point where now you're having more production per acre than you're having cost per acre. So again, this is kind of hypothetical, but there's some point at which you're going to have production per acre increasing at a rate greater than the cost per acre. But then you're going to reach a point where you add another animal to the land and you're adding costs, but you're not bringing those costs back. You're not you're not uh, getting enough revenue to cover those costs because the animals are not as productive at those higher stocking rates. So there's a sweet spot right in the middle. There's that some equal, optimal stocking rate that depends on the costs. And it's that point, it's, it's below that point where you in, add another animal and the revenue gained from that animal meets the costs of adding that additional animal. So if you track costs really carefully on a ranch, uh, as they have done in several research studies, 
then you can tell what that point is. Of course, that's a really difficult thing to track on the ranch, uh, but that's the concept that you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that the revenue of adding another animal is greater than the cost of adding that additional animal. This leads to the idea or the, the tenant that you can't overgraze and make money. At some point, you're going to put another animal out there that's going to cost more than its revenue. And a lot of people think that uh, when they see a lot of animals or heavy grazing, they think, oh, that person's just trying to make money. Well, you actually can't make money and overgraze. So my father-in-law, John, he used to say that he thought the best management practice on range might be to buy every rancher a scale so that they could start to look at weights and, and calculate costs and see how their animals were doing if that, that they were gaining enough weight to, bent, to um, justify the stocking rate. Of course, it's not that simple. There's a lot of things going on. But in concept, the important point is a person cannot overgraze and make money. So net revenue, again, though, remember, is, is defined by a lot of things, not just that cost of production. But it's there's a lot of variation there. There's a huge annual, annual forage production uh, change from year to year, depending on how much moisture there is or the weather. The production per animal, uh, the pounds per acre, determines the production per animal and other factors. Uh, we don't always have much control over those two. We certainly don't have control over the market price, unless you're doing some things like uh, cost averaging or you know buying futures we don't have much control over the cost the price that we get when we take animals to the market the one thing we do have uh, control over is our costs so if you start to go think to schools like ranching for profit or workshops that are based on uh, making a profit in ranching they'll spend a lot of time talking about production costs that is the best way for us to handle um, managing our income, our, our profit on ranches is by focusing on costs because that's the only thing we really have control over. Okay, so in summary, let's talk about what stacking rate we should set relative to the carrying capacity. Again, thinking about carrying capacity being that level at which uh, you could uh, have animals on the land without causing long-term damage. If you're interested in rangeland health, you would want to set stocking rate less than or equal to carrying capacity because you want the land to be productive on the long term. If you're interested in livestock production, you need to set stocking rate less than or equal to carrying capacity because if you start to increase the stocking rate too high, the animals are very sensitive and they won't be as productive. If you're interested in economic gain or returns, you need to set stocking rate less than or equal to carrying capacity. So there's really no good reason to overgraze. In all the cases, you, you would want to set stocking rate something somewhere below that level that the land can handle for a long-term basis. So having said that, why is there overgrazing? I guarantee you there's overgrazing out on the land. We've all seen it. Why does that happen? If what I've just said is that there's really no good reason to overgraze, whether you're interested in the range health, the animals, or economics, why is there still overgrazing? I don't have the answers to write down here, but some that I think of is one. Generally, I think ranch managers, uh, range managers are optimistic. They always think it's going to rain the end of next week, that they're, it's going to it's going to get better. So they, they probably don't sell their animals or reduce their stocking rate in time throughout the growing season. Also, some people just don't, they're just kind of ignorant. They just don't really think about it. They just don't know what to look for. And so they're, they're not paying attention to details and, and they may not be seeing them. So they may not be well uh, versed in trying to understand and look at what would indicate a high or low stocking rate. Um, there are some reasons that might be legitimate for overgrazing. For example, you know you're going into a drought, but you don't want to sell cows because you know you're going to need to buy them back next year and there will be a lot of um, cost of acquiring new animals and you've already invested in these animals. They know your land. You've, you've um, got them to a mature weight, so you've got them through that development cost of a cow. So especially in breeding animals, you, you, know, wanna, you wanna hold on to them and you may know you're going into a, a rough year and you're gonna have to sustain some heavy grazing, uh, but you may not wanna sell the animals. So I don't know, uh, you can think about it. People that you know, why is there still overgrazing out there? So those are some guidelines for setting a proper stocking rate. That'll give you a context for actual, doing the, the actual math of setting a stocking rate.